election. My name is Karen Koslowitz, and I am chair of this committee. Before we begin this hearing, I would like to introduce the council members of this committee who have joined us today. We have Minority Leader Stephen Matteo, Vanessa Gibson from the Bronx, Adrian Adams from Queens, Margaret Trin from Manhattan, Robert Cornegy, the tallest, <laughs> the tallest elected official in the world uh, from Brooklyn. Counts, no, he's not here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> council member Richie Torres and council member Mark Traeger. And we will be joined by others shortly. I would also like to acknowledge Rules Committee Counsel Elizabeth Guzman and the staff members of the Council's investiga Investigative Unit, Chuck Davis, Chief Compliance Officer, and Andre Johnson Brown, Investigator. Today, the Rules Committee will consider the nomination of Mr. David Burney to the New York City Planning Commission. Pursuant to the New York City Charter, the Planning Commission must consist of 13 members. The mayor appoints seven members, including appoint appointment of commission chair. The public advocate appoints one, and each of the five borough presidents appoints one. With the exception of the commission chair, appointments to the Planning Commission are subject to the advice and consent of the council. Planning commission members serve for staggered five-year terms and may serve as an unlimited number of terms. The chair receives an annual salary of $214,413. The vice chair a salary of $65,121. And members, a salary of $54,150. Planning Commission members have several responsibilities, including city planning for future development, assisting the mayor in developing capital programs, overseeing environmental reviews, preparing zoning and planning reports. Should candidate Bernie be appointed to the Planning Commission, he will fill a vacancy and serve the remainder of a five-year term expiring June 30th, 2019. I would like uh, Mr. Bernie sworn in at this time. Good morning. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and its testimony you are about to give? I do. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, I have an opening statement I'd like to make, if I may. Um, good morning, Chairman Koslowitz, uh, members of the Rules, Privileges, and Elections Committee. My name is David Burney. I'd like to thank Mayor de Blasio for nominating me to this position and Speaker Johnson for the opportunity to appear before the committee as a nominee to the New York City Planning Commission. I'd like to begin by describing my background. I'm a registered architect. I've worked in private practice and in public service. Since 1990, I've worked in the city in various capacities under four very different mayors. I was the chief architect for the New York City Housing Authority, the NYCHA, for 14 years. And then I served as the commissioner of the New York City Department of Design and Construction for a decade, ending in 2014. My philosophy has always been that good architecture and design should be available to everyone, not just the wealthy. And despite the financial constraints that NYCHA labored under, we were able to deliver a number of well-designed community and senior centers for residents, like that one at Melrose, Van Dyke, and Stapleton Houses, as well as a modest amount of good housing on vacant HPD-owned sites, such as Lower East Side 3 and Stanton Street in Manhattan. During my tenure at the DDC, I continued the same philosophy that public work should be well-designed, mm -hmm. and that in fact, given the importance to the city uh, streets and public buildings, design excellence in public work is actually essential. 
Through my work at NYCHA and DDC, <clears throat> I've come to understand the intricacies of the city planning processes and deepened my interest in urban development issues in the city. Currently, I'm professor in the Graduate Center for Planning in the Environment at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, where I founded a master's program that focuses on the design and management of successful public space. Our programs at the Graduate Center focus on community-based planning and aim to provide graduates with the technical expertise to navigate complex planning issues and processes. In fact, a number of graduates work uh, in, in the city administration, including the council's land use division. My program concentrates specifically on public space, covering the design and community engagement processes that lead to successful uh, public spaces, including streets, plazas, and parks. So the mission of the City Planning Commission is to make comprehensive, strategic, and thoughtful land use decisions that will improve all of the city's communities. However, many new development proposals, including many as-of-right projects, fail to thoroughly address basic urban design questions, such as how buildings interact with and support street life, or how the design of buildings can complement rather than overwhelm existing neighborhoods. And to further compound this, environmental impacts are complex technical doc documents that require careful consideration if mitigation can be effectively addressed. So should I be approved, I would commit to using environmental impacts as a guide to thoughtful mitigation planning that addresses critical urban design questions. My background as an architect, public servant, and a professor of planning, I hope give me the unique experience and expertise to contribute to the work of the City Planning Commission from a design perspective, particularly with respect to the impact of new development on our communities. I thank you for the opportunity to discuss my nomination to the CPC and have provided advice and consent. I look forward to working with City Council and I'd be happy to any, answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. <clears throat> I have a few questions I'd like to ask. Previous neighborhood rezonings have been conducted in areas that are predominantly communities of color, such as East New York and East Harlem. Do you believe that city-led neighborhood rezoning initiatives have targeted minority communities? I, I wouldn't use the word targeted. I, I think that zoning uh, is a tool in the planning process, and I think that we have found uh, in many of the rezonings, um, for example, in East New York and Jerome, where communities and elected officials have worked with the administration in a more holistic way uh, to look at those rezonings, that the outcomes have been beneficial to those communities. That they're being beneficial. I believe so, and they certainly can be, but I think it does require an effort both on the part of the community, the elected leadership, and the administration to, uh, to make sure that the process is, is beneficial. Have you read the council report on planning for school capacity? And what do you think of the recommendation we laid out to make sure we, we're building enough schools to meet our future needs? My apologies, I have not read <laughs> that report. Um, and I do know that the Department of Education plans, tries to plan ahead, but I'm not familiar with the contents of that report, I'm sorry. Okay, because I know Personally, in my neighborhood, they're building, there's so much building going on um, that you worry about the infrastructure of the community. Mm -hmm. And certainly, there are not enough schools for the children to go to with all this building going on in my community. Right, right. So, you know, I'm, I'm a little frustrated in how this is being handled. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what are your thoughts on public-private partnerships for land use planning and development here in New York City? Do you see opportunities for growing these types of relationships in the future? I think public-private partnerships have a part to play. Um, I don't know if you have any specific ones in mind, but um, I think on a case-by-case -case basis they can, be, they can be useful where city dollars can leverage more money from the private sector, I think it can be beneficial. Okay. Um, I want to call on um, Councilman Torres. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, Mr. Bernie, it just struck me that you were formerly the chief architect for the New York City Housing Authority. And, and as you know well, public housing has a towers in the park 
design, which disconnects the residents from street life. There's a lack of retail. And, and it seems to me the city has no real strategy for fostering a mixture of uses and ground floor retail in public housing. Mm -hmm. So I guess what are your thoughts on what the city can do yeah. to improve the diversity of uses in, in public housing? Yeah. And that's my only question. So. Yeah, it's, it's an excellent question, and, and this is a longer conversation that I could yeah. <laughs> talk about for a while. And in fact, when the Housing Authority first started in, in the 30s, if you look at um, Williamsburg houses, Harlem River houses, there was not only residential, there was retail at street yeah, level. that's right. Yeah. There were daycare centers, there were health centers, there's even a branch library at Harlem River houses. But when the federal government got into the uh, process um, and, and HUD took over, they would not allow the construction of those things, a very short-sighted policy. So you were building large developments with thousands of units with no retail and none of those support facilities. Um, and I think now the challenge has been, you know, where does the money come from to actually provide them? And I think um, there were studies done. Um, in fact, when I was at NYCHA, we did a study uh, at Baruch Houses to actually reinstate some of the retail along, um, is it Columbia by the time it gets it? You know, if you look at, um, Peter Cooper, Stuyvesant, there's retail on the streets, and then you get yeah. down to the public housing and it disappears. Yeah. And it's because of that policy. So we were actually looking at ways to bring in, again, public-private partnership to try to develop retail on that stretch. Um, it, it didn't come to pass. That was in the Giuliani administration. It didn't, didn't come to pass. But you know, I think from, from a planning perspective, uh, I think it's a, a good thing that could be done. Uh, the issue is probably how to finance it. I just hope that to, to, within the constraints of your position, if you could make this a priority for city planning, because everyone recognizes the need for diversifying uses in public housing. Yes. But it's been languishing. Yes, agreed. Um, thank you. Okay. Council Member Cornegie. Good morning, Mr. Bernie. How are you? Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the, your many years of service in various capacities. Yeah. Um, I have a concern with um, retail as well. Um, much of the administration's focus, if not all, has been on affordable uh, housing and not much. I think as a matter of uh, city planning, there should have been in tandem um, opportunities for affordable commercial as well as affordable retail. There, there are places in the city, in Brooklyn in particular, where an emphasis has been paid to um, affordable housing, and then there's no services to match, and then the quality of life is decreased for individuals, even in, um, in places. So what we've done in my district is we've used the ULERT process very strategically uh, in an effort to also get commercial, you know, affordable commercial. Um, I wanna know uh, if you see that as a viable strategy or even as a priority for the administration going forward to, to make sure that there are opportunities for affordable commercial, where there is affordable uh, residential to improve the quality of lives of New York citizens. Yeah, no, no, I, I agree entirely. And as I said earlier, I think you know, zoning is a tool in a process, and I think we, we do need to think holistically about neighborhoods. It's not just about providing additional housing, it is about supporting the infrastructure, support services. Um, um, you know, there was discussion earlier about schools. I mean, all of these things have to be in included in the planning for neighborhoods. So I agree that that's part of the process. So, so I'm not a city planner, but because I formerly was the chair of small business and I'm currently the chair of housing and buildings, I have that intersection for me and have really a desire for city planning to be what it was. Like I've been around long enough to know the viability of actual city planning when it was at its heyday. Mm -hmm. um, and a revisit of that based on your resume was what I got excited about. So I'm hoping that we can yeah. uh, begin to have more dialogue about the intersection between affordable commercial and affordable retail uh, to make the city in general more viable. I'd be very happy to have that discussion, yes. Thank you. Council Member Adams. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Mr. Bernie. Thank you so much for appearing before this committee this morning. Uh, I represent portions of Southeast Queens and am a former co-chair of the Jamaica Now Leadership Council. Uh, the area, the downtown Jamaica core, is undergoing substantial development right now, reassessment, refurbing, you name it, beautification, all of that. Uh, I was looking at the answers to your questions, uh, your pre-hearing questions, and I'd just like for you to expound for the committee 
more of your thoughts on the most troubling areas of concern for the CPC. Um, expanding on my, which question were you referring to? That would be question number three. Question number three. In your pre-hearing questions. Yes, yes, okay. Where you spoke about density. Yes, and density. And development. Um, yes, uh, well, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I, I, I do think that, that zoning and the zoning process, zoning is a tool in a process, and I do think that uh, it behooves us to look at neighborhoods holistically, to uh, engage communities, to engage elected officials uh, as part of that process so that we understand the implications of what we're doing, that we address unforeseen consequences, and, that we're, and we participate fully in that process, and I think that's uh, one of the challenges of the CPC, yes. In your estimation, do you feel that the community or communities surrounding growth and areas of growth are given enough participation leeway in decision making and planning? I, I think it's important that they do. I think that uh, it's hard to say how much is enough and how much is too much. Um, there's obviously a challenge between infinite amount of time and wanting to move on with, with, with the process. Um, I think we have to do a better job at inclusion, not just, not just um, in informing, but including. And I think there's a, a responsibility there for communities and elected officials to, to make that process more effective. I would agree with you. I'm former chairperson of Community Board 12 Queens and would love to see, <laughs> would love to see more of a balance uh, between planning, mm -hmm. other aspects of management, and the community involvement. So thank you very much. Agreed. Council Member Traeger. Thank you, Chair, and uh, congratulations, uh, Mr. Bernie. Um, just a quick question re with regards to community boards. Um, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on how do we help community boards build further capacity in the planning process? Uh, many boards, rightfully so, um, complain that they are just simply in receipt of applications uh, most mainly private applicants who visit city planning and um, look to make either either obtain variances or start uh, a zoning change um, and they're simply just reactionary bodies uh, rather than being proactive bodies um, so what are your thoughts on how do we build capacity uh, your thoughts on providing planning experts embedded into boards uh, that serve the community's interest and not the interest simply of a private applicant because many times what we see there's a pattern where applicants hire the same zoning lawyers over and over and over again that really know at times how to game the system rather than how to really educate and empower people on making important community decisions. Mm -hmm. So I'm just really curious to kind of hear your thoughts on that and having planning experts actually uh, uh, funding experts to serve on the board as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, no, good question and a good point. And I think, um, I mean, originally community boards were called community planning boards, and one of their functions was to assess. In fact, they they're still responsible for doing a needs assessment um, for the community. And I think you're right. They often lack the technical expertise um, to fulfil that role. The, the, there has been recent uh, increased funding to allow boards to employ that skill, and I know some Pratt graduates actually are now working in, in community boards. Um, and then at the other end of the process, you, you'll remember when the 197A plans were being generated, um, when the community boards were delivering, uh, was the city actually listening? So we, we have to have a communication uh, system that, that really works. So technical expertise for the community boards and a mechanism whereby what they produce is actually incorporated into the process, I think is the answer. I, I would just flag for you, I don't have the data in front of me, but I'd be interested in knowing how many uh, zoning uh, recommendations or changes uh, were really born out of a community board without the city or a private applicant coming to them looking for changes. Mm -hmm. I don't know of many, certainly not in my neck of the woods. And whenever the question comes up, uh, we're, they're always discouraged, oh, it takes years and years and years, a lot of money to raise, and that really tilts the system in favor of people with, with money and connections. And so I, I think we have an obligation to help build capacity at the local level. 
I think there should be planning experts embedded in boards, uh, not, at, not at their expense, but at the city's expense, um, uh, to help build capacity. But again, I, I appreciate your service to the city and congratulate you on your nomination. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to interrupt um, questions to take a vote on Mr. Bernie uh, because some of the council members have to leave. We've also been joined by council member Rafael Espinal. Um, okay, let's call the roll per vote. One. William Martin, committee clerk, roll call vote, committee on rules. Council member Cornegie. I vote aye. Torres. I vote aye. Okay, thank you. Council member Chin. Council member Chin. Yeah. Okay, yeah, can I? Oh, yeah. Council member Espinal wants to vote. I vote aye. Council member Chin. Okay. I want to ask my question first. <laughs> Oh, can I interrupt you one more minute? Oh, okay. Second, actually. Uh, Council Member Mario. Mario. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Continue. I promise not to interrupt. Thank you. Me. Thank you, Mr. Bernie. Uh, you know, I represent Lower Manhattan, District 1. <laughs> and I'm sure you know that we have a lawsuit, the Council, uh, because we disagree with uh, Department of City Planning. Um, on the Two Bridges area with the development that was going in there uh, that the department classified as a minor modification mm -hmm. so that the development doesn't have to go through ULERP. Mm -hmm. And right now it's in court. Uh, but my question is relating to uh, what my colleague have asked in terms of really assisting communities and community board um, in neighborhood planning, community planning, because there were efforts in that area, mm -hmm. but it was not supported by city planning. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was like years and years of meeting, and we might have prevented what happened with these mega development coming in, and the attraction to the administration is that, oh, they're gonna be offering so many affordable units, and in reality, it's gonna destroy that area because it's gonna more than double uh, the population. And I know one of the questions that you answer talk about possibility of displacement. I mean, there's all these uh, issues that it's gonna happen in this neighborhood and it's gonna change overnight, and they're not really bringing in any kind of amenity uh, that really help the neighborhood. Uh, so. My question to you is that how do you see, in terms of city planning, really taking a more active role to assist community and community board to sort of like really do some planning going into the future that will benefit uh, the neighborhood, uh, that will improve the neighborhood? Um, and uh, I would love to, to hear your response to that. Yeah. Um, well, I, as I mentioned earlier, I support Council Member Traeger's suggestion about uh, better technical expertise at the community board level. I think it's really necessary. Um, I think the, the 197A process, when it was active, was, was useful, and, and I absolutely agree with you that um, community involvement, uh, effective community involvement with technical support is, would definitely be beneficial, and hopefully we can move in that direction. Uh, good to see you. Good morning. <clears throat> uh, I just want to follow up on, on Councilmember Chin's question related to uh, two bridges. There is a level of frustration from the council that the City Planning Commission doesn't always work with us on, uh, not, not on all things, on most things they work with us. Mm -hmm. But when there is a disagreement, when there is 
um, what we believe to be a rational case for there to be a difference of opinion, it doesn't always seem like that the commission um, is willing to entertain what we think are rational, reasonable uh, issues that are flagged. Now, mind you, you know this because of your uh, background and expertise. 99% of ULERP applications that are certified go through. They're approved, they're negotiated, they go to the community board and the borough president and the commission, they come to the council, and the final product is typically one that everyone can live with, whether it's an individual, re uh, uh, an individual rezoning or a neighborhood-wide rezoning. And I just want to understand uh, given that your uh, nomination is by the mayor, how you would define independence. Do you see it as your role? Because it's very rare that any mayoral appointee ever votes no on anything. Right, right. Ever. <laughs> Sometimes the borough president's appointments do it. Sometimes the public advocate's appointee does it. The mayoral appointments, they don't, they don't vote no. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's because there's a pressure given that you're appointed by the mayor and it's something his administration supports. So I want to understand how you would see your role as a commissioner in working with council members when there are uh, not knee-jerk but substantive, serious uh, issues of consideration that come up and how you would define your independence just because you're appointed by the mayor, what does that mean? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, well, I would say two things. First of all, my door, if I'm approved, would always be open to you and to other Council Members to discuss those issues. I, I don't believe that it should ever be closed. That I think the dialogue is, is essential. In terms of independence, um, I've served in the city under four different mayors. Um, my term would outlive the present mayor. Um, I believe I'm, my nomination was based on my technical and professional expertise, and that is what I would exercise and use my judgment on the matters and not be uh, influenced by political considerations. So what if uh, a commissioner or a member of the department asked you, uh, David, we, we really need you to vote in favor of this, uh, but you had some serious reservations about that, what would you do? Well, I was assured in my nomination process that that would not happen. <laughs> okay, that's good. <laughs> Which is good. Uh, and if it did, I would have to say that my professional judgment has to prevail uh, in every situation. There's been a conversation at the uh, currently impaneled Charter Revision Commission looking at the land use process writ large. And one of the, re there are many recommendations, but one of the recommendations that people have been debating back and forth is whether or not the city should have a comprehensive 10-year uh, plan as it relates to land use planning uh, to understand that we're not doing things block by block or neighborhood by neighborhood, but we actually have a plan on how we're citing things, what certain neighborhoods are uh, getting but other neighborhoods are not and taking uh, a real fulsome look at the entire land use process around the whole city. What do you think of a comprehensive 10-year plan? Mm. I'm not actually familiar with the details of that proposal but uh, you know as a planner obviously <laughs> I think planning is beneficial and I'd be really interested to learn more about it. Sounds like a reasonable idea. And When we talk about rezoning, we typically are focusing on, as we should because we have a housing crisis in New York City, we typically focus on affordable housing. But what are, what are some of the other things that when we're both doing neighborhood-wide rezonings and individual rezonings on a single lot, what are the other key things that you think we should be looking at in that process, uh, not just affordable housing, but affordable housing and, and what? I think we need to take a holistic approach to neighborhood planning. Um, you know, the affordable housing is obviously an essential component, but that often brings with it density, increased pressure on infrastructure. We need support services that, that complement the neighborhood. Uh, we need to be concerned about issues of displacement, which can often happen. Um, so I think, you know, the zoning is a tool to improve a neighborhood, but I think we need to look at um, those changes in a more holistic way. And what's, what should some of the other things that we look at? Would it be open space? Would it be school seats? Would it be transit, transit improvements? What exactly. else? Transit, uh, schools, open space, uh, health centers, libraries, um, all, all of the above. If you, if you think about a community, 
all the components that make that community healthy and successful. And those are things that we should look at for every project. Absolutely. And are, are you familiar with value capture? Yes, some, slightly. I'm not an expert on that topic. So one instance uh, recently where there was a, a opportunity to do significant value capture was the Vanderbilt rezoning next to Grand Central Station mm -hmm. where the developer SL Green was required to put in hundreds of millions of dollars into transit improvements, platform widening, elevators, escalators, egress and entrance into Grand Central to have the circulation be better for uh, strap hangers that use that station every single day. What are your thoughts generally on value capture? Um, actually, I was part of the facilitation team that went through the East Midtown rezoning, so I'm somewhat familiar with that whole policy, and I think um, part of the approach there was, if there's going to be an increase in density, how do you mitigate some of the impacts, particularly the, the additional people in transit, pressures on public space, and part of that rezoning uh, was actually to capture some of that value. The, uh, the transfer of development rights, there's a fee being paid to the city to pay for public space and transit improvements. Those developments that are astride uh, transit uh, subway entrances and so on are obliged to contribute to those improvements. So I think that was a, a viable uh, plan. Should we look to do that in other places? I, I believe so, yes. yes. I mean, I think there's been some legitimate concern from the mayor, which I am sympathetic to, that if you don't cra craft value capture in the appropriate way, you could have a lot of potential city revenue be diverted in a way that the city doesn't have control over, and that could create budget issues for the city. So my own personal feeling is we have to craft value capture in a way that doesn't harm the city's budget and bottom line, but still gets uh, transit improvement upgrades in necessary areas. Right, right. Oh, I, I would agree with that. I think there's, th there's money there, and uh, it can be equitably <laughs> distributed between public benefit and, uh, and private, yeah. One of the things that I called on a few weeks ago in, in my State of the City address was we have hundreds of inaccessible subway stations across the entire system, mm -hmm. which is just blatantly unfair for people with mobility issues, people who are in wheelchairs, and we deserve a, a subway system that's accessible to everyone, but we don't have the money right now to do that. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we floated, that I floated, was looking at developments that happen near, you could create a distance near an inaccessible subway station, and as they're going through a rezoning process, you could actually make part of the, the benefit, the give back to the community, putting in an elevator, putting in an escalator, putting in something that works for people with mobility impairments. Is that something you'd be open to discussing? Absolutely, in fact, uh, in, in a previous life, I was the project architect for uh, Zeckendorf Towers on 14th Street and that development paid for uh, elevators in the 14th Street subway adjacent. So yes, it's, it can be done. Okay, and lastly, um, uh, I see from your uh, very accomplished bio and your service to the city over many years that you're interested in good architecture and good design. That's right? Indeed. Why do we have so many ugly buildings in New York City? <laughs> and well, what are you gonna do to fix that? <laughs> They should, all Immediately. Be to, they should all be subject to the ULERT process, and then we'll make them better. See, no more as of right. <laughs> I'm see, I, I, as a commissioner, I hope that during the process you will actually seek to make them better because there are so many ugly buildings that get approved, and I hope that someone with an architectural eye and is, a, and I mean this in a loving way, is a design geek, uh, will actually do things to improve the materials and the look of the buildings and everything about them so that you don't have these horrible buildings that get put up and that 30 years from now or 20 years from now or two years from now will say, how the hell was that building approved? Yeah, I, I pledge to do my utmost in that regard. Madam Chair, I turn it back to you. Thank you. And with that, we're gonna continue the vote. Uh, we had some members voting before because there's a lot of committee hearings going on with votes and that's why they had to leave. So can we call the roll? Continuation roll call, the Committee on Rules, M140, Chair Kozlowitz. I vote aye and welcome. 
Gibson. Congratulations. Looking forward to working with you. I vote aye. Thank you. Chin. I vote aye. Thank you. Thank you. Traeger. Aye. Thank you. Adams. Aye. Thank you. Speaker Johnson. Uh, I want to congratulate you, and I look forward to working together on projects that matter to the council and to the entire city. And with that, I vote aye, and congratulations. By a vote of 10 in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions, item has been adopted by the committee. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with that, the meeting is adjourned.